If it's true what they say that your teens define you, then I belong to the 1980s, like I bet a lot of people here do. I belong to Adam and the Ants and Eurythmics, to Lady Di and Maggie T, to the Ethiopia famine, and to AIDS, to acid rain, Exxon Valdez, and the hole in the ozone layer. So by the end of that decade, I knew that I wanted to work for Oxfam or Greenpeace, and I thought the best way to equip myself for that was to study economics at university. So off I trotted. But the economics that was on offer, first it left me frustrated, and then it made me angry. Because the issues that I cared about were marginalized, glossed over, or sidelined. And if you've never, done, uh, if you've never studied economics, Now's the moment, because I'm going to give you a crash course in economics with a twist. I'm going to show you in three minutes what they never tell you in three years of a degree. So I'd like you to open your textbooks, please, at page 23, and study with me this diagram, the circular flow of goods and money. What we have is households providing labor, land, and capital to firms. In return, they get wages, rent, and dividends. And with that income, they spend it and buy things. They get goods and services. And so you've got the money going round and round, and the resources going round and round. It's simple. It's also very important because this diagram is at the heart of macroeconomic thinking. It's the diagram from which we measure gross domestic product and talk about the growth of the economy. And it's so simple that it goes right into the back of your head so quietly that you don't even know that it's there. But it's there. And that matters because it's fundamentally wrong. Now, we could add in a government sector and talk about taxes and austerity. We could add in a financial sector and watch it wreak havoc and the real economy. But I don't even have to go there to tell you that there are four things fundamentally missing from this diagram. The first one is that the economy is not floating on a white background. It's deeply embedded in the environment, a finite biosphere. And the economy draws in and spews out matter and energy from that biosphere. And the fundamental flow of resources in the world isn't money going round and round. It's energy coming in from the sun, hitting our planet, fueling life, and some of it then escaping as heat into the universe. And that energy is just like the grains of sand in an hourglass. It moves in one direction only. And we've got a chance to capture it at that point that it hits our planet and put it to use. The second thing that's missing from this diagram will be familiar to anybody who got their kids up and off to school this morning. And that's the unpaid care economy. Because the work of parents raising children, raising the next generation of workers, the housework, looking after your elderly parents, this is the stuff that family life is made of. And it's what reproduces us for the next day. And yet it's practically completely ignored in mainstream economics. And this woman's got a bucket on her head because if you go to Africa or South Asia, you will see women and girls carrying their body weight in water, in firewood, in food on their heads with a baby on their backs. And all of this for no pay. So if you ignore the unpaid care economy, you're ignoring the work of half the world's women and the stuff that keeps their families alive day to day. Third, not all exchange that matters gets monetized. I'll babysit for you tonight if you look after my cat this weekend. OK, that might sound trivial. How about we all go online and create the world's biggest encyclopedia ever for free? How about we hook up students from Latin America, Africa, and Asia with the world's top professors at universities and give them a university education for free? Anybody who ignores the potential of the collaborative commons outside of monetized exchange is probably missing the most dynamic and disruptive part of the economy. And lastly, that little happy household getting wages, rent, and dividends. Well, we know it hasn't turned out quite like that because some households have got pretty low wages and they've been stagnant for decades, whereas others have been gaining the boom of wages, high rent, and high dividends. So these households are actually worlds apart. Now, if you point this out to your economics professor, they'll say, mm, externalities, yes, very interesting. 
But we covered that in week three, and we really need to concentrate on the core concepts of economics, which is economic efficiency and economic growth. And that's why we're going to stick with this diagram anyway. And let's be honest, all those arrows, well, they just spoil the maths. So we'll go ahead with this anyway. Well, that's why I threw away my textbooks. And I walked away from economics. And I decided to immerse myself in the real world challenges. So I spent three years working in the villages of Zanzibar with barefoot entrepreneurs. Then I worked for four years at the United Nations and I witnessed the barefaced power play of international negotiations. And then I became a mum of twins. And so I spent a, a year knee deep in nappies, immersed in the bare bum economy of raising tiny children. And I got gender like I never had before. And what I realized from all this was that you can't walk away from economics because it's all around us. It's the world we live in. It's the mother tongue of public policy. It's the mindset of the society that we've been raised in. And so I decided to start walking back towards economics, but to flip it on its head. I mean, what if we started not with money, but started with the values that we actually want to live by? Let's start with us, all seven billion of us that we have human rights. We have a right to use resources to meet our needs for food, water, healthcare, education, jobs, energy. And then let's start with the home that we have and ask what makes a home worth living in? What about this lady? What is it that keeps the planet in a fit state for humanity? Now, if you were to look at a graph of the last 100,000 years of the temperature on this planet, you'd see it's incredibly volatile. And then in just the last 10 to 12,000 years, it's become extraordinarily stable. It's the era of the planet's history known as the Holocene. And Earth system scientists led by Johan Rockström in Stockholm have asked, what is it about the Holocene that's made it such a sweet spot for humanity, that stability that's given us agriculture? Because when it's stable, we can plan our food and plant and reap a harvest. It's given rise to all the great civilizations from Latin America to Asia to Europe. So we'd be absolutely crazy to kick ourselves out of this sweet spot without even realizing what it was. So I decided I want to put these ideas together. The idea of the planetary boundaries of environmental integrity and the social boundaries of human rights. And I wanted to draw a new picture, the kind of picture that I actually wanted to have in the back of my head. And I apologize for the junk food, but it, it just looks like a donut. So the center of that is the point where humanity is putting no pressure on the planet. And as we go out, we're using planet's resources until we've gone over an environmental ceiling. And you can see it's an act of a balance. How do we get everybody out of that space in the middle of human deprivation without going over the planetary boundaries into environmental degradation? It's a balancing act, and it's going to take a lot of redistribution to get there. I think of this as a compass for the 21st century, of where we actually want to be going to. And then if it's compass, we want to ask ourselves, well, where are we now? Well, the plan of your boundary scientists, sorry, the, the, on the human rights, if, if everybody in the world had the resources they need to meet their human rights, that entire orange circle would go bright orange, the whole thing would be filled. And you can see that on all of these human rights dimensions, there are millions, billions of people who don't have the resources they need. One in eight people don't have enough food to eat. One in five live off $1.25 a day. One in five people don't have access to electricity. So we've got a long way to go in terms of resharing the resources to make sure that everybody has just the basic minimum to lead a life of dignity. And on the planetary boundaries, Earth system scientists estimate that we've gone over at least three of these boundaries. On climate change, we know we're putting too many greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're risking tipping ourselves into a really hostile climate that is not benevolent to humanity. Nitrogen use, we're putting way too much nitrogen into the soil as fertilizers, it's leaching out in the oceans and killing off sea life. And biodiversity loss is massively over what you'd expect the rate to be. If these arrows were complete, they would be hitting the walls of this room. And when I put those two pictures together, to me, that's an indictment of the path of economic development that we followed till now. Because we've busted over several of the planet's boundaries of safe use before we've even met the human rights of half its population. What if you could put your life on that table and ask yourself, how does the way that I shop, eat, travel, vote, affect humanity's ability to come back inside that donut space? What if every company in the world 
had to meet and strategize around this table and ensure that the very way it did business was bringing humanity into the donut, so respecting the rights of its customers, its suppliers, the people it's buying for across the world, but also ensuring that the way it's producing is coming back and reducing its impact on the environment, even regenerating it. What if when the world's governments meet at the United Nations, okay, that's not the world's government meeting at the United Nations, but I presented this idea to the UN General Assembly last year, and I said, guys, you need a new negotiating table. I mean, imagine if the world's governments could sit around a table on which they could see our common vision for humanity. Wouldn't that change the way they talk? That they could actually negotiate from, not from short-term national self-interest, but from collective common long-term interest. And there's a heck of a lot of collective common interest we need to be thinking about. As we head towards 2050, we know the global population is going to grow. We know that three billion more people will join the middle class and they'll want to lead lives like ours. We know that climate change is kicking in, water scarcity. There's a lot of tackling, a lot of issues we need to tackle and we need economists who are ready to take that on. So that's why I'm really worried about today's economic students. Because just like me 20 years ago, they're still looking at this diagram. So if you want to help create the next generation of economists who are actually equipped to take us to 2050, I invite you now. All you need is a pencil. So what you have to do is sneak into the office of every economics professor you know, into the library of every economics student you know, take down from the shelf that textbook, open it on the page of the circular flow of goods and money, and with your pencil, draw in a box and label it the environment. Draw in the unpaid care economy. Draw in social exchange and the collaborative commons and separate those households into the worlds apart that they live in. What a favor you'd be doing to the next generation of economists, giving them a picture in the back of their heads that actually represents something like the world we live in. You want to go a step further? Rip that page out and put in its place this donut and we can start the course again. You want to be an economist? Fantastic. Forget about money for a minute. Let's talk about this planet, its systems, its living systems, and those that keep us in a stable state, the sweet spot for humanity, and how we need to look out for those. Let's talk about its people, that they have human rights, and it takes resources to meet those rights. So we've got a balancing act to do here. Now, as an economist, your job's a crucial one. You've got to help design the institutions, the government, the public sector, the markets, the regulation, the incentives, the financial system, that will actually bring humanity into this space. If that's what it means to be a 21st century economist, now I want to be one. But what would that economic system look like? Well, one thing we know is not going to be 20th century capitalism with this narrow focus on individualism, on accumulation, and on growth. A donut economy is going to have to amplify community, distribution, and regeneration. And here's the good news. Today's economic students know that what they're being taught is not equipping them for this future. And instead of walking away from economics like I did, they're organizing, and they're organizing internationally, and they're demanding a new curriculum, new theories, and a new syllabus. So there's a chance of change from within. So if you want to help them with that movement, speed it along its way. And if you want to actually do a favor to all future economists, get busy with your pencil. Thank you. <laughs>